what's up everybody what is up happy wednesday hump day all right i got my thing set up here sorry 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 let me get this thing going all right guys uh thank you for joining us on a special early edition of facebook live with mel and charlie uh charlie is will be on uh hopefully um in a little bit as you know charlie takes care of the security at the lihui airport so uh six o'clock is a little early but uh, obviously we have a very special guest tonight and uh we we work around his schedule he's a very busy guy i'll be introducing him shortly he'll be coming on at seven but uh, i did want to uh, thank you all for jumping in tonight uh please 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 now would be the time to share this broadcast we are live on facebook youtube twitter and linkedin uh, but if you can share this right now and get as many people on to get informed tonight uh, we have Dr. Jerome Kim. He's a director general of the International Vaccine Institute Institute in uh, South Korea uh, from Honolulu originally. Uh, and we'll, we'll do his bio in a little bit because, you know, oftentimes we get accused of fear mongering. And, and you know, it's always been our policy to uh, bring on guests that are experts, uh, certified experts, not YouTubers. I posted an interview that he did on December 4th on the Asian boss on YouTube. I posted a, the, that video on my page. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, what I did was I took a lot of the questions that he discussed, all of, that he answered, and, and a lot of the topics that he discussed on that podcast. And uh, I did, for the first time in the history of Mel and Charlie show, sent him a list of questions that I believe are important and relevant uh, because of the time. Uh, we, we definitely appreciate Dr. Kim taking an hour out of his busy schedule to share with us. So in interest of time, I, I sent him a, a bunch of questions and topics to discuss, many of which you folks have been asking about uh, over the past several months. So uh, and, and uh, so we'll just turn him loose on all of you and, and hopefully we can gain some information. But now is the time to share this. Also, if you haven't done so, uh, please go to my YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, you know, we wanna we wanna put out more videos and content on YouTube as well, and not always on Facebook. But yeah, so if you haven't, go over to it's Mel Raposo all across the platforms, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or uh, LinkedIn. It's all Mel Raposo. But if you could go over to the YouTube channel and uh, subscribe and hit the little bell next to uh, the subscribe button. That'll alert you every time we post up a new video or if we go live on YouTube uh, or Facebook. So please, if you can do that tonight after the show, I'd appreciate it. We're, we're, I want to hit a thousand uh, subscribers on YouTube just because um, I think it's cool. But also we want to start utilizing that platform more and being able to share others' videos like the Asian boss on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we want to get that out to as many people as possible. So I'm excited for tonight, guys. Uh, if, if you did watch that segment on Asian Boss, you you see Dr. Kim it knows his stuff. And I think once I read his bio in a little bit, uh, you guys will understand uh, what I'm talking about. Um, we have we've had so many experts on our show uh, and all are, are beating the same drum. And but there have been a lot of questions that have been posed to me. Oftentimes, we don't have the time to go through all the questions, so I did prepare uh, a bunch of questions for Dr. Kim, and uh, I mean, I really cannot wait for him to come on. Uh, you know, it, it, we don't know. We still, we still too soon to to determine exactly what Omicron will do. We know that the transmissibility is high. Um, we're, we're looking, you know, now Pfizer is saying they believe their booster shot will uh, will help against serious illness and hospitalizations with the Omicron variant. Uh, but we all got to be vigilant. I mean, we still got to be vigilant. And, uh, you know, please, 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 please stay safe. And we can. We can be safe and uh, coexist with this, with this thing. Um, we have, uh, you know, there's a, uh, oh, my God, I forgot. What's that app? Someone help me. What's the app? The app that we just went on last night. We got some new viewers, new friends. Um what is it called? Hang on, guys. I got to go look them up on my phone because it sucks getting old, people. The clubhouse. The clubhouse. 
<laughs> and I'm assuming someone will be posting that link up. Uh, after tonight's show, we'll be having a, a clubhouse discussion. It's an app that you download. It's free. George, maybe you can, or someone out there that's on, uh, we can you can post up the link, download the app, uh, and then uh, I'm sure someone from Clubhouse, Dana, someone can help you all uh, download the app and and come to our room that will be uh, we'll have the post show discussion in the clubhouse and and it's it's uh, it's audio only so don't worry you don't have you're not gonna be on video but it's free and uh, we'll have some post show discussions uh, for about an hour i guess um on clubhouse so if if any of you are interested uh dana or someone george or one of you that's uh, already in in the clubhouse maybe can post up the link the share link or the app you can go to the app on your i, I apple store or your uh your other whatever the other one is, Google store, and uh, just search up, search up um, Clubhouse and download the app. Again, it's free. Yes, we're on early uh, because we have Dr. Jerome Kim and he, uh, you know, there's an, a massive, yes, Clubhouse, that's the one, Roxanne, massive time difference, obviously. So, uh, yeah, we, we work around the doctor's schedule so that we can get him on. And uh, I don't have to remind you folks to be professional. If you look at the comments right now, the Clubhouse link is on. And, uh, and it is free on Google or, or the Apple Store. And uh, you can go ahead and, and jump on. Now, so, yeah, so it is, we, we did start early tonight. Dr., uh, Dr. Kim will be on at 6 o'clock. And we will, we will tear right in. I'll read his bio for those that, uh, and I know a lot of people don't, Maybe didn't see the or didn't notice that the time was uh, one hour earlier, but that's fine too uh, because the information that he has, whether you see it live or uh, after the the recording or the live recording, not a problem, right? That's why we have YouTube. That's why we have LinkedIn. That's why we have Twitter. You can also see this broadcast on any of the other uh, bro uh, platforms as well. So uh, I also tagged and invited all of the media outlets uh, newspapers as well as tv news we'll see i haven't seen anybody pop on yet from there they may watch the the recorded view or the re recorded one because they don't want to pop up on our stream and i don't blame them uh, i think you know uh, so sometimes in the comments people tend to get a little nasty with the media so whatever it is however we can get this information out to the general public i will tell you right now what you can do is hit the share button just hit that share button right now. Share it on your page. Share this video broadcast on your page right now. And we will get as many people on as possible. And we'll promote the heck out of this thing. Because listen, Dr. Kim is an international renowned expert. Uh, Senator Kochi, thank you for joining us tonight. Senate President uh, Ron Kochi is in. And I'm glad he's here to listen. Uh, because a lot of what Dr. Kim will talk about tonight is not being... Uh, said or not being told by anyone else. And uh, he does it in a way that we all can understand. He does it in a way that normal people like us, uh, Dr. Kim will be on at six o'clock. Relax, Alyssa, hold on. I know I'm kind of boring. I'm kind of blah. Uncle Charlie is probably on his way home right now. I'm assuming he'll be on at some point. Uh, but Dr. Kim will be on shortly and uh, and we'll get we'll get going. I, I can guarantee you that this will probably be one of the best uh, episodes that you've ever ever seen. Uh, it's definitely going to be informative. It's definitely going to be science based, and it's coming from South Korea. He's going to be broadcasting uh, live from South Korea, where, as you know, they're having some challenges right now with with COVID and uh, and and Omicron. So, yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. Other than that, man, how's everything going? I hope you guys all dry. Uh, for those of you on the other islands, Big Island, Maui, uh, and Oahu, geez, um, you guys got hammered. And uh, we, we we got spared here on Kauai. We got rain. I mean, we got we, it rained the entire day uh, on, on uh, what is that, Tuesday, Monday. But nothing that uh, created any type of, of major problems for us here. So for that, we, we thank God. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read Dr. Uh, Kim's. So he, well, let's wait a minute because it is 559. 
Yeah, I think we're all going to be, we're all excited. We have had Dr. Kim. Listen, let me just say, Dr. Kim has always, whenever we have sent out the request for Dr. Kim, he has always agreed to come on. Um, no excuses, never any, uh, never any question. Just uh, go ahead and just, just says yes, Mel. Uh, work with our sec- my secretary and we'll, we'll figure out a date. Uh, do you need a smart device to join Clubhouse? I believe so. I believe you do. Uh, I'm not sure if it works off of the computer. Um, and just as promised, Dr. Jerome Kim has just popped in. I don't see a video, so I'm not sure why. Is it not on? Mm. You hear yeah, me? I, got, I, I can hear you, Doc. I cannot see you for some reason. Okay, I think. Let's see. It might be my system is not used to your... Just go ahead on the on the settings. There should be a settings wheel, like a little gear on the bottom that you can. Uh, this is what I love about live, about being uh, live. You know, you, yeah. Hit the settings and then choose your camera, and then you'll be fine. You, you're okay. coming in very clear. Your All audio. Right. Uh, extreme cam. There you go. Here. We can see you. Good to see What's you. Happening? Thank you. I don't know where Charlie's at. Uh, he, he's probably driving home. I, I don't know if you know, but he took on a job, I think, since the last time you were on. He, he, he's now the head of, he takes over the entire uh, airport police division here on Kauai, as well as the Big oh. Island, Maui, uh, and, and Oahu is run by somebody else. But anyway, Dr. Kim. Oh, and there is Charles. Hang on. Let me grab Charles real quick. There he is. <laughs> hey, Charlie. <laughs> How are you? Uh, muted, Charlie. Muted. I can't hear you, Charlie. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, there he is. Right. How you doing? All there? right. Uh, Great. You? Hanging in there. It's been a, it's been a busy journey being in charge of the airports for the outer islands. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, so traffic has picked up again. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Wow. It's uh. We're- you, if you, if you look at it, you you never think it it slowed down. You, you never think that COVID was ever present. It's just it's just a lot of people. Yeah. They figure we'll we'll get into that a little bit. They figure about yeah twenty thirty thousand uh, arrivals a day here in Hawaii. So, but um you know oh. I know Doc, your time is very precious, and we want to yes. make the best of it. But I do want to. I'm gonna this. We didn't do this the last time. I want to read your bio because I think it's. Uh, I want our viewers to understand that um, that oh, you, we're not. No, no can I ask? Yeah. I, I, so I'm at work, but I got this from Patty. So that's why oh, I'm worried. Oh, <laughs> so Patty Kawakami. Patty Kawakami, your mask has made it across to South Korea. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> hey, uh, Charlie, can, are you see, watching this on your phone? I, I am. Uh... I'm I'm looking at my phone and it's frozen for some reason. I don't know why. But no. But okay, good. Main thing no. is that no one's no one's saying anything. So okay. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And we apologize. We came on an hour early. So I think a lot of our viewers uh will be jumping on at seven o'clock to find out that we're done, but they will be able to watch the replay. I just want to say, guys, we got Dr. Jerome Kim. Uh and he's right now he is in South Korea. He's the director general of the International Vaccine Institute. He's an international expert on the evaluation and development of vaccines. He has strong scientific experience, experience which spans basic research through advanced clinical development. A graduate of the University of Hawaii, Roger, local boy from, from Oahu, and Yale University, where he got his doctorate, Dr. Kim completed internal medicine and infectious disease training at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Kim was a principal deputy and chief Laboratory of Molecular Virology and Pathogenesis at the U.S. Military HIV for the UH, I mean U.S. Military HIV Research Program, and also served as the project manager for the HIV Vaccines and Advanced Concepts Evaluation Project Management Offices, U.S. Army Medical Material Development Activity, Fort Detrick, Maryland. He led the Army's Phase Three HIV vaccine trial. That was the first demonstration that an HIV vaccine could protect against infection, as well as subsequent studies that identified laboratory correlates and HIV sequence changes associated with vaccination. 
Dr. Kim's research interests include HIV molecular epidemiology, host genetics, and HIV vaccine development. He has authored, listen to this, over 160 publications. 160 guys. He's not a YouTuber. And received the John Mar, uh, Mayer Award for Research Excellence from the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences in 2013. He is a professor of medicine at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences and an adjunct professor of graduate school of public health in Seoul, uh, uh, public health of Seoul National University. He is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. And the only reason I bring that up, guys is because I get irritated when uh, people rely on uh, YouTube podcasters who's trying to develop and build their channels and build their viewership. Uh, we're talking about a guy who's published over 160 articles. This guy is smart. He's, smart. He's, he's qualified. And again, I explained before you came on, Doc, because we value your time, I sent oh, we, we never ever did this before, but I sent over questions. Uh, that we took off of the Asian Boss broadcast on YouTube on December 4th, which I thought that was probably the most informational interview I've ever seen. It, it, it covered all of our bases, so I condensed it into uh, a, a bunch of questions um, that I'm hoping that you can cover tonight for our viewers. So, Doc, thank you again for joining us all the way from South Korea. Always my pleasure. Good to see you guys again. So let's just start, as, as you can see, I, uh, with the questions. Where are we with the vaccines in COVID? Can you discuss the vaccine trials? Just just give us a brief overview of where we are uh, with vaccines. Now we got Omicron, but just generally, where are we in the world with vaccines? Okay. So, um, you know, around the world, different regulatory authorities. So if you imagine the US FDA, but in different countries around the world, um, have approved 28 different vaccines. But of those 28, only eight are emergency use listed by the World Health Organization. The emergency use listing by the World Health Organization means that UN agencies can purchase the vaccine for use around the world. The United States has actually only approved three. Hopefully there'll be a fourth soon. Um, that's Those are the vaccines from Pfizer, Moderna, and, and Johnson & Johnson, or sometimes known by its Belgian designation, Janssen. Um, and those are the ones that are approved in the US. In, in Europe, the AstraZeneca vaccine has also been approved. Um, but there are other vaccines. There are vaccines from India. There are vaccines from China uh, that are also, and vaccines from Russia. Um, and so, you know, when we look around the world, there are a lot of different vaccines. Eight are really w, have the WHO seal of approval. Um, and those are the ones that are principally used uh, in vaccination programs around the world. Now, we talk about those vaccines as being a part of wave one, um, but wave two, or actually, for some reason, they call it wave 1A, uh, but the second wave of vaccines where the final results, the in, well, actually not the final results, the interim results uh, came out this year or anticipated you know, by the beginning of next year um, are really interesting because there are a lot more of what we call protein vaccines. You know, we have the RNA vaccines. Actually, now India's got an approved DNA vaccine. Uh, we've got the adenovirus vector vaccines, like the one from Janssen or the one from AstraZeneca. But we've been waiting for these vaccines that we call the protein vaccine. And Novavax would be the first. Actually, they announced their results in January of this year, but they still aren't approved. Um, but Sanofi, which is a big vaccine company, you probably all receive vaccines from Sanofi in the past. Um, and, and also uh, two Chinese companies, and, and hopefully soon a South Korean company, all have vaccines in the final stages of testing. Some of the results have already been announced and, and some of the vaccines have received preliminary approval from their local regulatory authorities. So for instance, the regulatory authority in China. Um, and then we have vaccines that are still um, being tested. And those vaccines are being tested all over the world. Uh, although some of them are being tested, you know, comparing the vaccine against a, an active substance called a placebo, um, many of the studies are now what we call um, non-inferiority. So they're comparing one vaccine to the other so that, you know, for instance, if you have a vaccine, a brand new vaccine, and you test it against the AstraZeneca vaccine, and you show the same levels of this infection fighting protein, we call it neutralizing antibody, then your regulatory authority, uh, for instance, the regulatory authority in the United Kingdom called the MHRA could say, okay, I believe that um, this vaccine is 
as good as AstraZeneca, which I've already approved, so I'll approve your vaccine too. And those are what we call um, the wave, uh, wave two or wave three, depending on how you count waves. Um, being from, from Hawaii, we are very particular about what counts as a wave and what doesn't. But um, those wave three vaccines, again, are very interesting. Some of them are protein. Um, there are some new kind of concept vaccines, you know, a vaccine made in plants. Um, and so again, these are um, like platforms that we're not familiar with. You know, RNA, we all know now. Um, protein, we've had before in, in many vaccines. Um, the Chinese vaccines and, and, the, and a vaccine from India, some of them are, are just killed virus. Um, all of the WHO approved vaccines have been shown to be safe and efficacious, and their efficacy has varied from 50% for one of the Chinese um, companies, Sinovac, to 95% for Pfizer. And those were the phase three trials. And now we have data from what we call effectiveness trials. Effectiveness trials generate what we call real world evidence. Um, we take the vaccine and we vaccinate as many Americans as we'll take. Them. And then we look to see who's getting infected. And the good news is that against the current variants, we're not sure about Omicron yet, but the variants that we know of, um, the vaccines remain effective and safe. And just to give you a number, vaccination in the United States itself is associated with a five times reduction in infection comparing vaccine to unvaccinated, a, a, a 10 times reduction in hospitalizations and a, and a tenfold reduction in death as well. So the vaccines are working. They are safe and efficacious, and they're protecting people against severe infection, um, hospitalization, and death. Uh, that's really what we wanted the vaccines to do, to protect individuals. The bigger question, and we don't have the answer to this yet, is do they actually protect society against uh, through indirect mechanisms, what we called herd immunity in, in the past? And, um, and we're still waiting for that answer, although you know, we, we've seen certainly that Delta and now Omicron are capable of, of infecting people who've been vaccinated and also people who've been previously infected. Um, so that's, that's what I think people are worried about with regard to this Omicron variant of concern. Sorry, long answer. Oh, can't hear you. There's a, there's a lot of people that are, are saying, hey, why take the vaccine? Every, every you know vaccinated people are getting infected vaccinated, you know, what, natural immunity, I've heard works better. I've, this is the arguments that we're hearing about why we shouldn't vaccinate, but there's many reasons why we should get vaccinated. And, and I think what you're talking about is so far the evidence in the real world cases uh, are showing that it's quite, quite beneficial. Well, why yeah. are, why are cases still rising? And uh, I know one of our viewers uh, keeps reminding me that, hey, all of these countries and states that have high vaccination rates, uh, their case numbers are climbing as well. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, and, and actually, and, and we actually now do have some really interesting data out of one of the Chinese studies. And, and this is actually a vaccine. It's made by a private company. It's supported by the Gates Foundation and a global organization called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. The, the company's name is Clover, and they make a protein-based vaccine and their vaccine is combined with a special um, chemical that we call it an adjuvant to make the vaccine stronger. That adjuvant comes from a, a global company called GSK. It's a great adjuvant. Um, Clover's data is interesting because they actually vaccinated people who'd been infected before. And, and because they tested their vaccine all over the world, we were able to tell you how well the vaccine did overall against all variants, all comers, and then how well it did against um, the Delta variant in the setting of prior infection. So if you had been infected and then you got the Clover vaccine, you had a roughly 80% vaccine efficacy on top of previous infection. So you have a certain level of protection uh, with uh, previous infection. And then when you get vaccinated, you get a, 80, uh, a vaccine efficacy of 80% on top of that. Against Delta, it was 64%. Oh, sorry, sorry, I have it backwards. Against Delta, it was 80% against all different variants, it was 64%, on top of the protection you already see uh, with natural infection. So vaccines work. The other part is, and, and I think you raised a very important point, you know, why are we still seeing infections? So 
when you look at the, the original studies that were done, the original studies didn't actually look at pre prevention of infection. The original studies, and, and you may remember way back when we were talking about these, they're looking at the prevention of mild to moderate symptomatic PCR positive disease. Why? Because, you know, 80% of people who have COVID are, are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic. It's really difficult. It would, these trials would be much more complicated if we had to send people home with, you know, self-administered nasal swabs and then have to do the testing and, and things. Um, so most of the studies didn't look at that. They looked at symptomatic disease and the, the vaccines. When we talk about Pfizer, 95% efficacy, it's at the prevention of mild to moderate symptomatic PCR positive disease, not infection. And many vaccines, actually, we, we don't often think about it and we don't necessarily, doctors don't necessarily communicate it this way, but many vaccines work that way. Um, because the thing that we can see, the thing that we can diagnose, the thing that makes people sick um, is disease. Infection, you know, sometimes the vaccine deals with it pretty well. Uh, and in the setting of, in, in COVID, actually the vaccines do a remarkable job. Tenfold reduction in hospitalization, tenfold reduction in death if you've been vaccinated compared to unvaccinated. So, Vaccination right now, we're pretty sure protects you. It protects your spouse, your children, if they've been vaccinated. What we, what we know now and, and, um, is that it probably does less well for protecting against infection. Although again, five-fold reduction in infection, still pretty good. Um, and, it, and what we really are trying to get a handle on is how well it prevents transmission. And, and we really don't have the complete answer to that. There was a recent study published, and this is a study from the, uh, from the UK. And the UK generates a lot of these studies because they have a, a national healthcare system. So they can, they can keep records uh, for the national system. And it looks like for the original, one of the original variants, variant alpha, you know, both AstraZeneca and Pfizer uh, appeared to prevent transmission within households for a period of time. And that effect waned. For Delta, it didn't protect against household transmission. It protects against disease, but it doesn't keep you from spreading the, the virus to others. So people are going to get infected, but luckily because you're vaccinated, you won't develop disease. You shouldn't go to the hospital most of the time. Now, what else do we know? We know that if you are elderly, if you um, have another condition, which we would consider um, something that weakens the body's defense system, um, you needed a, additional doses. And increasingly people are, are thinking that we need booster doses, that we need to give your immune system a reminder of what it got before. And, and one of the interesting things is, and, and this is again, data that are just emerging, you know, we wanted to give people two doses as quickly as possible, you know, at, at zero and three weeks or Pfizer zero and four weeks for Moderna, um, zero and, and four weeks for the uh, Janssen, or sorry, Janssen we gave once, AstraZeneca we give twice a month apart. But it looks like as you space the dose out, if you wait uh, eight months or 12 months to give the booster dose, the amount of, of antibody you, you make may be higher. You, you really do see a boost. The, the level of protection goes up significantly. And the big question is, it goes up, does it come down just as quickly or does it stay up for a long period of time? And that's, you know, I mean, we've had these vaccines for a year. Um, in, in common use, and, and we've been testing them for a year and a half, so we don't have all the answers yet. But I, I think that's a really important question. Now, hospitals are filling up. Most of the people in the hospitals are often people who are unvaccinated. It's still happening in parts of the United States that have very low vaccination rates. Remember, again, so I, I think, I don't know if I've talked about it on this show, but you know, vaccines are really important because as you saw, they reduce hospitalization, they reduce death. But if you have enough infections, even if only you know 1% of people who get infected go to the hospital, you'll start to fill up beds. And these are not standard hospital beds where you can put two people in the room. Often these are isolation rooms or intensive care unit beds. And you know those beds are in relatively short supply. I mean, no country keeps in excess of empty ICU beds. They're the most expensive beds in the hospital. So again, we have to be really careful and we have to remember that vaccines are part of a solution, but a comprehensive solution. What we know prevents spread are masks, distancing, and avoiding crowds to the extent that we can. So it's vaccination, 
boosting if you if you are eligible for boosting, and then using masks, distancing, and and uh, of crowd avoidance, again to protect other people from you if you're infected, and protect you from other people, um, even if you're vaccinated. Well, hang on, Charlie. Yeah. Okay. Go. Go ahead. So, Dr. Kim, you 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 mentioned earlier about all these different vaccines. To what extent, or how is it compared? So you know what the players are, right? You you've got new vaccines coming on board. What do you use as a co- a comparison to? I guess to to drive it, one its efficacy. I know you have to do trials, but then when you're it almost seems as if when all of these were brought in, we we're kind of racing against time, right? So maybe the amount of trials that we would like to have seen wasn't there, possibly. So what do they use as a, sort of like a comparative uh, uh, table of contents, if you want to call it that, to see what is good yeah. and what's not good? That's a great question. And it's really difficult to do because if you're a vaccine company, you do not want your vaccine to be compared head to head to somebody else's vaccine. That's like doing the Coke versus Pepsi test. Most companies don't want to do that. In fact, we're having a really hard time finding companies that will offer something that we call a comparator. So for instance, if I have a new vaccine and I, I you know, I can't test it against placebo because we know the vaccine works. So what we should do is test it against another licensed vaccine, a vaccine that's been approved. We cannot get companies to give us that vaccine. So it's really a difficult situation um, around the world with regard to comparators. Um, what do we use as a comparator? So theoretically, under, under ideal circumstances, if we had an RNA vaccine, we compare it to an RNA vaccine. You know, it's really tough if you want to compare yourself to Moderna. Moderna had, you know, among the highest neutralizing antibody titers of any of the vaccines that were tested. Um, so this would be you know, if we think that neutralizing antibody is what we call a correlate of protection, that is the higher it is um, above a certain level, people aren't going to get infected or sorry, aren't going to develop mild to moderate symptomatic PCR positive disease. Um, you know, if you were a, a new vaccine, would you compare yourself against Moderna or would you pick Pfizer, which is a bit lower, or would you pick Janssen, uh, which is a bit lower? And so this is a part of the scientific design of the study. But truth be told, we can't get the vaccine for comparator anyway uh, at this point. So we're trying to, we have to sometimes come up with new and unusual uh, means to get vaccine from different uh, companies. Sometimes an organization will actually buy the vaccine and then um, and then use it in, in comparison studies, or it's usually not a commercial organization. So it's often a government that can do that. Um, or the government will call one of the companies and say, look, it's really important that you give us this comparator. And they'll say, okay, we'll give you, I mean, this, I'm not exaggerating, 2000 doses, that's it. That's how many you can have to do your test. And, um, and so it's really difficult, but it's a, it's a very important point because as these new vaccines are coming up, some of them have some very interesting qualities. Uh, some of them are, are combining them, are being combined now with these very powerful um, we call them adjuvants, things that make vaccines stronger and last longer. And that's what we really want. We don't want to be vaccinated every six months. Um, and part of the other thing is, you know, some of the new vaccines and some of them are interesting concepts. Um, you know, I think most of us remember, actually, I think I remember getting a polio shot first and then getting the oral polio vaccine afterwards. Um, And and so people will remember that. We don't use the oral polio vaccine in the U.S. anymore. We've reverted back to shots. Um, But the oral polio vaccine was interesting because it was um, it was alive. It was a form of the polio virus that had been weakened um, and used then as a vaccine. And um, if you think uh, other vaccines, the measles vaccine is similarly. It's weak. It's a weakened form of the virus. So the question is, if we took COVID and we weakened it, could we use it as a very powerful vaccine? Because, you know, measles vaccine is tremendous. You get two doses and you're good for life. Um, and we would be really, really great if we had a COVID vaccine like that. And so, you know, one of the companies has a live attenuated, or actually a couple of companies now have live attenuated COVID vaccines. And, and the really big question is, will this stop transmission? And will this be uh, long lasting protection against 
disease or, or maybe even infection again. So um, big questions and, and really important, but it's difficult at this point. The research is complicated by the fact that it's difficult to get vaccines to compare against. Doc, in uh, an Asian boss, you you brought up an interesting uh, discussion regarding direct and indirect protection, and um, I thought I was fascinated by that. And I was hoping you could share that tonight, and maybe because I, you know, again, your time is so valuable. Uh, maybe go right into the Omicron, uh, what's happening with Omicron, uh, as, as far as you guys can tell. Okay, so first. Um... Let's see if you, there are three ways that you can think about uh, vaccines, right? There's, um, we say efficacy. That's what we measure in a phase three trial. Efficacy looks at protection of an individual. And again, the definition that they use for protection was against mild to moderate symptomatic PCR positive disease. And the way you design a phase three trial with vaccine and placebo, and you try to minimize what we call bias so that when you get an answer, it is a clean answer, you know, like Pfizer, 95% efficacy in prevention of mild to moderate symptomatic disease. Great. Then you take it into the real world and you're not necessarily looking at protection of individuals. Now you're looking at the protection of populations. We call that real world evidence. And, you know, the US CDC is tracking real world evidence. The other uh, groups like the Veterans Administration, I don't know how many of you are veterans like me, but um, so they've used Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen. And if you look over time, effectiveness drops off fastest for Janssen, which is a single dose, slower for, um, drops off slower for Pfizer and drops off slowest for Moderna. And again, you know, this is a study in 700,000 vaccinated veterans. It's really important. These are the kinds of studies that really begin to generate the, the kind of information we need on, on whether boosters are, need, are needed, for instance. So effectiveness. That looks at protection of populate, direct protection of populations by a vaccine. And then the final part has to do, and I, we call it impact, because it's looking at the total benefit from vaccination. So not only do you protect the people who are vaccinated, but do you get indirect protection of people who are not vaccinated? So what we would call herd immunity. And, and with herd immunity, and just to give you an example, we have an oral cholera vaccine. <clears throat> Excuse me. The oral cholera vaccine has efficacy about 60%. So it's, you know, I mean, compared to Pfizer, efficacy of 95%, right? Ours is against cholera, 60%. If you vaccinate half of an Indian city, you get effectiveness of 80% in the prevention of symptomatic um, diarrheal disease caused by uh, cholera. So that's a lot of indirect protection. So the 50% of the people who are vaccinated are protecting um, a good portion of the unvaccinated population against cholera. And so the question is, if we vaccinate enough people in the United States, and that magic number has been migrating upward from 70%, <coughs> um, will we start to protect people who are unvaccinated? And that's true. It may be difficult to apply to the U.S. as a whole. Why? Because California can't protect Arkansas. It's the people in the community, it's the vaccination rate in the community that's protecting other people in the community. And the US is big enough so that, you know, when you're located 1,500 miles away, uh, unvaccinated people are not gonna be protected by people who are, you know, on the East Coast or the West Coast. So it's, it's a little more complicated, um, but ultimately impact is what matters. Um, and impact is what people develop vaccines for. We wanna minimize the impact of COVID-19 disease on populations in the United States, in Korea, and elsewhere. Um, do you want me to go into Omicron or do you have a question about uh, those three? Sorry. You're muted, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I, I don't wanna create any additional noise. No, I was gonna say, yeah, we, we get into Omicron, but I did wanna at some point later discuss Hawaii's uniqueness because of the influx of new people every day uh, that comes into our state uh, versus areas that are relatively uh, steady with, with population. We, we have a changing population daily uh, because of the industry, the visitor industry. But yeah, Omicron would be a great time to, to start sharing with us. The, okay. the new buzzword is Omicron. 
Yeah, Omicron. So remember that um, variants, you know, so again, and, and I actually saw one of my friends did a uh, presentation um, and, uh, and she's, a, she's another uh, molecular geneticist. And she said, you know, this tiny little dot, and it looked like a fleck of dust on the slide. This is the amount of variation in COVID. And since we study HIV, you know, this is the amount of variation in HIV in a single year globally. Um, so COVID doesn't vary much, but the mutations matter. And they matter because we've developed a safe and efficacious vaccines and the mutations may have an impact on the ability of those vaccines to do what they're supposed to do, which is prevent infection, hospitalization, and, and death. How are variants generated? Well, variants are generated during the process of viral spread within a community. So outbreaks generate variants and variants, unfortunately, generate outbreaks. And so the best way to control that is to interrupt the outbreak by instituting you know, things that we can do, masks, distancing, uh, hygiene, avoiding crowds, and then vaccinating. Um, those tend to limit outbreaks and will hopefully um, slow the generation of variants. The Omicron variant is, is unusual. And, and I think that the joke now is, of course, that WHO skipped over the naming of some variants. The new variant, which comes after um, mu, so mu is the Greek M, nu is the Greek N, uh, xi, which is xi, is the next letter. And of course, that looks like Z, which is the name of the president of China. So they skipped that one and they went to Omicron. Omicron is unusual. Uh, you know, when we look at the new variants, for instance, alpha or delta, we're looking at maybe four to eight changes uh, in the spike protein. With Omicron, it was 25 or 26. It depends on the sequence and you know which virus they're looking at. If you look at all the sequence changes, um, it's over 50. It was a, a significant uh, change in the number of potential mutations. And how do you analyze that? Well, there are several ways. The first way is you get the sequence off the, the sequencer, it goes into your computer and you do, we call it an in silico analysis, like a silicon chip. Um, you analyze it in your computer. And the analysis suggests that there are mutations there that would um, tend to allow the, the virus to spread more quickly in populations. So these are mutations that allow the virus, for instance, to latch on to human cells more easily, or um, some mutations may allow the, the virus to enter human cells more easily, which could relate to the severity of disease. Um, one of the other disturbing things that, is that when you look at the mutations, some of them you would predict would make the virus immune, or, well, sorry, it would, it would make it difficult for some of the treatments that we have for COVID. These monoclonal antibodies from Eli Lilly, Regeneron, and others, um, to help to slow the progression of disease from mild disease to severe disease. So monoclonal antibodies are really great, um, but if you have enough mutations in this spike protein of COVID, then you could run into a problem where the monoclonal antibodies no longer bind and no longer do their job. And so that, that, that's the other um, potential thing. And all of this we can do just by thinking about it, by looking at it in a computer. But that, that, that unfortunately doesn't necessarily tell us the truth. To get to uh, a better truth, we need to do um, laboratory experiments. So we take it into the laboratory and we run it through a series of, of tests. We call these neutralization assays. And neutralizing antibody, the, the infection fighting protein that is induced by vaccination or natural infection that binds to and inactivates the virus is really important, we think. It appears to be what we call a correlate of protection against um, disease. So that also makes it very important. And we can test the Omicron variant uh, in a test tube and look to see whether um, blood from a person who had received a vaccine or blood from a person who had previously been infected will inactivate the Omicron variant. And then the final thing that you can do, and this will take even longer, is to wait and, and watch and see what's happening in societies around the world. <clears throat> Are more people with Omicron going to the hospital? Do more of them require uh, intubation? Do they need to be on ventilators? Do they have other problems that we aren't seeing, for instance, with Delta, or that are very different from what we saw with Alpha or the original Wuhan strain? Um, and that will take weeks to develop. 
So the first set of data from test tube experiments came out. And I have to say that it's tough to look at because you know they have maybe a dozen people. Uh, they tested it very quickly. They don't always have, it's, the experiments are not ideal uh, from a scientific perspective. But the first study uh, was interesting because if you were, if you'd been infected, this is from South Africa. So if you'd been infected and then you got the Pfizer vaccine on, uh, and then you got the Pfizer vaccine, you have a very high level of protective antibody of infection fighting protein. And it works really well against Delta and it works against um, the beta strain that was circulating in South Africa. Great. But against Omicron, it dropped 40 times. So 40 fold reduction in protection. If all you got was the vaccine, so if all you got was the five, two doses of Pfizer vaccine, you had a very, very low level of protective antibody against Omicron. That is That makes you nervous. Right, and you look at that and you think, okay, and that was two, that was one month after vaccination. What's what's it going to be like six months after vaccination? So the initial test tube thing, which was a bit messy and not ideal, um, raised concerns. I know WHO said, oh, nothing to worry about, but when you the data are um, are interesting, and and we we definitely need more, and we need for it to be controlled. Uh, well, and they have to compare it to other uh, samples that we have available. Um, but it gets to the idea that, you know, Omicron may be able to, to escape around some of the protective responses and infect people more easily. But then the, the important question is, and this gets to the third question, right? What is the real clinical, you know, so it infects you. I mean, if you're asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, you don't need to go to the hospital. Yes, you can spread it to others, and that would not be a good thing if you spread it to someone who's, you know, who are, who's elderly uh, or couldn't defend themselves against infection. It could be lethal. But by and large, you know, individual people may not be badly affected. The problem is that we don't have that information yet. The information from South Africa and from some of the countries in Europe and now the United States are saying, well, the infection so far looks pretty mild, which is good news. The problem is a lot of those people who are traveling were vaccinated or had been infected. In South Africa, natural infection in the community in some places is, is over 50%. So they have some level of protection already. So we have to be really careful when we say, oh, it looks like it's mild. It might be mild to a person who's vaccinated. It might be mild to a person who had previously been infected or was infected and then vaccinated on top of it. But to a person who's never seen the virus before, it could be very dangerous. Um, and, and so this is why we have to be careful what we say and, and really look carefully at, at data that are available. If you look in the parts of South Africa where uh, Omicron was initially described, now about 60% of the cases are caused by that virus. Um, and it's beginning to take off. When you look at just the number of sequences that are done from Africa, fully 60% of them are Omicron. Um, but of course, we're interested in Omicron, so we're sequencing more of them. But again, you know, I think it's something that we have to be watchful for. We know how fast Delta spread. I mean, eventually it got to the United States and it wasn't, it was just a few months before it was the predominant mutant in the United States. So again, um, something to keep an eye on. Hopefully it, maybe it spreads more quickly. Hopefully it won't cause a severe disease, but we don't know yet. You know, you mentioned earlier that uh, what is known to be a, uh, I guess a key factor in in, in trying to defeat uh, these these viruses is the mask wearing, the social distancing, and so forth, right? But I guess human the, the human aspect is people don't like to be told what to do, and yet the experts are telling them that you know you need to do this in conjunction with having the vac getting vaccinated because that's the only way. <laughs> Because I'm still trying to wrap my head around, you know, some individuals say that, you know, they've taken all the necessary precautions, but they still get sick. So that means that somewhere along the line, they kind of <clears> step <throat> over that boundary where, I guess, for some reason or another, it happened. And, and, and they, 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 got, they got tagged with the virus. So um, what, would you, what would you say to, you know, the many out there that still 
questions, you know, if if this doesn't seem to be moving as fast as the Delta variant, as an example, what would you say to them that about Omicron? Is it, it may be unassuming, but if it builds enough, it, it can be very, very uh, yeah. bad. What do you say to them? So I think, um, you know, when we think about controlling COVID, right, um, there are things we can do to, to reduce disease. And, and that's really important because it's disease that kills people. Um, infection is the first step, but disease kills you, right, or makes you sick. Or, And how do we reduce disease? Well, before you're actually infected, you get a vaccination. And even if the vaccination doesn't protect you against infection, we really do know that it prevents you from getting sick. I mean, from getting sicker. I mean, you don't know what would happen if you hadn't been vaccinated. But what we do know from large studies now is that vaccination is effective. It reduces infection by five times. It reduces hospitalization by 10 times. And it reduces death 10 times compared to unvaccinated. So that's really clear. The other thing that reduces disease, that is progression of disease, once you get infected, if you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, would be... Um, some of the medicines like remdesivir, which is um, somewhat efficacious, the monoclonal antibodies, like the ones from Eli Lilly and Regeneron, which again, um, are effective in reducing the transition from mild disease to severe disease. And then these newer drugs, one from Merck and one from Pfizer. Um, the Merck one is about 30% effective in preventing mild disease from progressing to severe disease, That's important. Um, the Pfizer one appears to be really significantly associated with, uh, you know, like 90% um, with a prevention of, of transition from mild disease to severe disease. The thing about these, about those, uh, about monoclonal antibodies and drugs is you have to be tested. We really want to know if you're infected because we don't want to give these things to people who are not infected. Um, so that's one thing. So you can prevent disease that, that we know how to do. Preventing infection is more difficult. And we do know that masks, distancing, separation um, do prevent infection. I think most of us remember from the lockdowns that have occurred in various places around the world, that's actually really effective in reducing infection. I mean, making sure that no one meets anybody and everyone's staying at home, but that's not a, a long-term solution either. Uh, and we know that. Um, we do know that vaccines do reduce infection somewhat, not enough. Um, in some cases, uh, we're hoping that vaccination shortens the period that a person can spread the virus. Um, that might be important. Um, and then there's also a possibility that under certain circumstances, these monoclonal antibodies, uh, if given uh, to prevent infection, might be able to do that. So if you've been exposed, for instance, one of the big questions is, well, the monoclonal antibody, if we give you a shot like we do if you got uh, bitten by a dog uh, and they give you the rabies vaccine. You know, one of the things that we we're trying to do is see if, if some of these either vaccines or some of the monoclonal antibodies will prevent people from actually developing infection. So we call that prophylaxis. Um, and that's a, a really important question. Um, but definitely protect yourself from disease with vaccination, protect yourself from infection using the standard techniques. Um, and protect others um, if you're infected by using, again, masks are probably one of the most important things that we have to keep others from being infected by you. And I know people don't like being told what to do. I mean, I certainly don't. Um, being in the military, I, I've had to take lots of vaccines. Some of them were somewhat painful. Um, you know, we, give all the, we gave all the military members anthrax vaccine. We have way more data that the COVID vaccine works and protects than we do with the anthrax vaccine, but we were told to take it and we did. So that's the military. I don't, everyone says, well, that's just the military. But, um, but we do a lot of things. You know, when I was growing up, my parents smoked in the house. We, they smoked in the airplane. Um, they smoked at work. Now we don't. Why? We know that secondhand smoke causes about, you know, 30 to 40,000 cancer deaths a year. 30 to, 30 to 40,000. We make people smoke outside and it, smoking outside, like if you're in Korea in the winter, means smoking outside at minus 16 degrees centigrade. But they do it because that's the rule. We're protecting other people from the consequences of secondhand smoke. Why do we make people get licenses, driver's licenses? 
Um, you know, big inconvenience, anyone can learn how to drive a car, but there's a certain amount of protecting others uh, and being responsible. So again, I, you know, I'm not the government. I don't make the rules. Um, we live in a democracy and, and you know, but we do have to vote on, on and, and make a statement around certain things. And I think one of the things that we sometimes forget about is that every right has a responsibility and our, you know, certain rights to freedom and to do things have a certain other part of a responsibility. The right to drive carries responsibility not to drive irresponsibly or not to drive drunk. The right to smoke, not to expose others to potential cancer. So again, I'm not a philosopher either, as you can tell, but um, yeah, it's a it's something that every society has to answer for itself. As a follow-up question, real quickly, um, someone had asked, what happens if you, if you were able to take all the vaccines, like Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, would you overdo it? <laughs> Is there any really bad side effects that could happen to you? Some people. So wonder. right now, I, I can I can tell you that um, that I know some people who've taken more than one. Um, but um, so there are some theoretical reasons why you shouldn't. Um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, as we space the vaccines out farther and farther, the, um, the level of boosting is much more significant. And potentially the, the time that, that the antibody hangs around may be prolonged. If you take them too close together, the immune system goes, ah, I've seen that before, and it won't even boost. So if you give the doses too close together, sometimes you don't see what we call a boost. You don't see the second shot giving you a higher level of protection than the first. And so as we space it out, and, and there's actually just been published data now on a, on a Chinese vaccine where they did the same thing. They gave a third dose either, you know, so they gave two doses a month apart, and then they gave a third dose a month apart. So another month, so three doses in three months. And, or they gave two doses, and then they waited eight months and gave a third dose. And the level of protective antibody that they saw when they spaced it out was about four times higher than if the doses were close together. Again, just getting to the idea that, you know, uh, spacing, the immune system likes a little bit of space in between reminders. Um, we also saw that with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which they don't have in the United States. But if you gave a dose and you waited a month, you had an efficacy of about 60% in the original study, 70% in the American study, but 60% in the UK study. If you waited to 10 weeks or 12 weeks, efficacy was 80%. So you, you saw a lot better protection if you spaced the dose out a little bit. And again, this just gets to the idea that the immune system has certain requirements. And if you give the doses too quickly, um, sometimes you, um, you don't get an optimal response, optimal protection. The other part, and, and this is again, highly theoretical, and you know it's theoretical because they call it original sin. Um, but it, what it, it reminds us is that the immune system um, likes what it see, has seen before. Um, kind of like all of us, you know, if we have seen somebody and, and we see someone who looks like them, we say, oh, that's, you know, it's Charlie. And, but it might not be, it might be someone who looks like you. Well, the immune system is exactly like that. And after a while, if we give too many doses too close together, the immune system starts to think that everything looks like what it saw the first time. And it doesn't change itself. It doesn't create new versions of the protective response. Um, and it's because it, it's, its reference point is fixed because we've given too many vaccines of, of one type. And so it's really theoretical um, and, and it gets raised with when we study, like for, in my case, HIV vaccines, we were talking about that. We've talked about it with influenza vaccines. Um, but again, you know, we, um, we don't know the answer to that yet for COVID vaccines. Yeah, I think we've got to remember that this is still a relatively new uh, vaccine, and we're still looking at the trials. Doc, um, the mixing of vaccines, can you overdose from this vaccine? If I went and took a J&J, &J and then I took a, I had a J&J, &J, so my booster was a Moderna, uh, my wife, had, I mean, can you, you mix them up? Can, is there a way you can possibly overdose from this thing? So, um, so I, the short answer is probably not. Um, you know, I also got um, the J&J &J vaccine first, and I just, uh, maybe three weeks ago, got my Moderna dose. Um, 
the mixing and matching, again, you know, just hypothetically, uh, may be something that your immune system likes. So again, you know, you you see the same slightly, you see the the COVID spike protein, you know, that thing, the little club that sits on the outside of the virus, but you see it in a slightly different way. With um, Janssen, you were getting the, the vaccine in a way that would, um, that we say, stimulate a different part of the immune system. You know, you not only normally, if you were infected with COVID, your body would make these infection fighting proteins, but it would at the same time be making a bunch of different cells. We call them white blood cells. And um, my mother, who was a nurse, would call them the white guards, the, the soldiers um, that protected you against infection, the thing that, that causes your tonsils to swell up. Well, these cells are really important and they're slightly different. Some of them are helpers. Some of them it, it basically serve to Im improve your ability to generate infection fighting protein and improve your ability to generate these killer cells, which kill virus infected cells. The Janssen vaccine is an adenovirus based vaccine, AD26 is what it's called, adenovirus type 26. And it is pretty good at stimulating these T cells. The mRNA vaccines are great for antibody and they do stimulate T cells to some extent, although many people think that the Janssen vaccine is better for that. So by mixing and matching, you're now stimulating multiple parts of, you're stimulating the whole immune system. Maybe that'll correspond to better protection or maybe protection against um, broader protection, better protection against variants. Again, you know, these are all hypothetical uh, and we really don't have the answers yet. So that's the mixing and matching and why it might be beneficial. Um, overdosing, again, you know, it's what, what would be the consequence of overdosing? You know, you might start to see less of a response to vaccination. Vaccination itself causes a rise in antibody type, right? The, and then the boost causes a, another rise. Whether it goes higher or stays the same or slightly lower uh, is something that we're, we do see if we give the vaccines too close together. Um, and we tend to see a better response if we space it out, if we give the second or third dose, you know, months away from the first two. One real quick question, Doc. <clears throat> Vaccine hesitancy is a problem uh, across the world, really. Um, really, really a problem here in, in America, United States. Um, how safe is a vaccine, especially for children? I we got a lot of questions about should we vaccinate our children? Uh, I think we've it's pretty clear that it's a relatively safe vaccine for adults, but how safe is, how safe is it for children? And what would you say to our viewers that have kids that are on the fence, whether or not they should vaccinate their kids? Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we know that, that kids do get infected. In fact, many of the hospitalizations in some parts of the United States are children. Um, and there are over a hundred children, I believe, who have died in the United States. Actually, Korea now has two children who've died from COVID uh, as they've opened up schools. And, um, and so I think that the head of the US CDC, um, Dr. Walensky said, you know, we shouldn't be seeing 10 children die from COVID. Um, and if we can protect children directly, we should. Um, you know, maybe parents are waiting until the protein vaccines are approved. You know, the vaccines like the one from Sanofi um, or the one from Novavax, um, because they're in much more common use. But, you know, we have a huge safety database for RNA vaccines. I mean, we vaccinated over a billion people with RNA vaccines. And the systems that we have in place, at least in the United States and in Europe, Australia uh, and other developed countries, uh, was able to pick up a side effect, right? This blood clot formation with the AstraZeneca vaccine at a level of one in 100,000 to one in 250,000 cases of uh, vaccines administered. That's a really, really small number. One in 200,000 is roughly your risk of dying uh, after being struck by lightning when you walk outside, um, which is pretty uncommon, I would say. I mean, but. So, you know, the vaccines have enormous, I was uh, one of the reviewers for one of the Indian vaccines. And again, you know, this vaccine has been around, it's been approved for about a year now. Um, its safety database at that point was over 70 million, seven zero. Now it's an inactivated, whole inactivated virus vaccine with a special kind of adjuvant tweak that may make it more effective. But 
I mean, 70 million doses have been administered safely. And, and you know, that kind of safety is something that it's diff is difficult to see in the first year that a vaccine is being used. Um, I don't know if people remember, but you know, many children get a vaccine against something called rotavirus. Um, and the new rotavirus vaccines, I mean, 80% of American children are getting rotavirus. It used to be rotavirus would put hundreds of thousands of children in the hospital in the United States. And, you know, a few would die. But now you can't see rotavirus diarrhea in the United States. In order to see it, I'd have to take medical students to Thailand, um, where they, because of the cost of rotavirus vaccine, they don't vaccinate all the children. Um, you know, I think it's, parents are very concerned. These vaccines have really remarkable safety records and we are keeping a better eye on safety here than, you know, because of, um, of, of issues around, you know, people are concerned about vaccine safety. But these vaccines are, um, you know, one in a hundred thousand side of, uh, severe con complications for the blood clots and we found it. Um, and we found it in the first few weeks. So again, you know, people are alert. These systems are in place and they appear to be working. Well, thanks, Doc. I mean, you know, the, the problem with having you on, man, the time goes by so quick and we, we, was, we just want to, we just want to keep you, but, uh, you know, I, I did want you to address a little bit about Hawaii. Uh, you're from Hawaii, although you're in South Korea right now. But we obviously we spoke earlier of how we bring in 30,000 people a day uh, from all over the world. Um, we have, you know, some of our leaders talk about Omicron mm -hmm. as if it's, you know, not to worry, uh, you know, the, the sign. You, I remember you just said a little while ago, we got to be careful of how we communicate uh, with Omicron and everyone from from the national level down to our local level. But we have this influx of new people that come in every day um, and in fact, some of our leaders have actually made the statement that Hawaii, uh, that COVID is endemic in Hawaii. I'm really concerned that that, that message is being uh, taken by our people as, you know, it's time to drop our guards. It's time it's safe. And in fact, on Oahu, as you, I'm sure you know, you're from Oahu and you have family there, uh, the restrictions were dropped and it's, you know, no, no uh, capacity limits anymore, no social distancing requirements in bars and restaurants. Uh, masks, of course, but if you're eating and drinking, you can take it off. What are your thoughts? Uh, first of all, on the on the on the uh, idea that we're endemic here in Hawaii, and about loosening restrictions as Omicron is still being uh, identified and and, and uh, researched. Yeah, so I would be careful about the use of the word endemic um, because you know people are vaccinated. Um, and what does endemicity, if you're saying that endemicity means that there is local, continued local transmission of the virus, then yes, I guess Hawaii has endemic COVID at a low level, still relative to much of the United States. What we do know is that when uh, a variant like Omicron or well, Delta, definitely, and, and perhaps Omicron, because it looks to be as transmissible as Delta, if not more transmissible, in fact, um, there's, there was a recent study. It looks to be about two and a half times more transmissible than Delta. And these are data from a colleague at the National Center for Infectious Diseases in South Africa. Um, and they look back over um, data from the beta variant, the Delta variant, and now Omicron. And they, that's how they came up with the idea that it was two and a half times more transmissible. Um, so we have to be really careful because every variant is different. You don't want to fight, you know, if you, they say that the generals always fight the last war. Well, you know, we don't want to be fighting the last variant. Um, so, you know, the state has to be alert to the potential for transmission. For the potential for transmission that comes from having lots of people coming to visit. And the risk that this poses to individuals. Um, the elderly who may be, you know, for whom vaccine responses may not be as, as strong and whose vaccine responses may uh, go away more quickly. Um, and, and governments exist to protect people. Um, and the government has to balance the uh, protection of people 
against you know people having a livelihood and going out and working and doing things and it's possible to, to maintain that balance i mean korea now i think we've seen a recent spike in the number of cases um and icu bed capacity in the designated icu hospitals you know the ones that can handle COVID uh, patients is 90 percent but they just opened up additional beds so a bunch of other hospitals that didn't have that designation are were already in reserve um but the government is tracking all these things and and are, is letting people know where they are every day um and you know if the state government does that and is watching and is careful and can do sequencing and enough diagnostics quickly enough um you know they may be able to protect people um 30, 000 coming from all over i mean and i just <clears throat> hawaii was one of the first places in the u.s to report omicron you know in korea they saw it um very fairly quickly after it was announced in, in people who had been tested before um, tested before arriving in, in Korea, tested on arrival in Korea, and then who subsequently tested positive. And, um, and those individuals at the, had already managed to spread it to a person who drove them from the airport and then to uh, people in their church. Um, so again, you know, we, we do know that masks protect people against transmission. Uh, sorry, masks protect other people from you if you happen to be infected. Yes, you have to take off a mask to eat. And, you know, normally the amount of time uh, that you'd spend, and again, this is time and distance, um, is, you know, you don't normally sit in a restaurant for you know, hours and hours um, you know, or in settings where you're going to be exposed. So we have to kind of balance things. Um, it's really important to keep an eye on this uh, and to have diagnostics and to be able to surge if cases start to emerge very quickly. Uh, the last thing you want is for hospitals to be full and not have backup plans and, and then to be caught flat footed because you weren't monitoring appropriately. So again, you know, try to open up, but be vigilant about uh, what the consequences are. And for that reason, keep an eye on things to make sure that nothing gets out of hand. Hey, doc, Dr. Kim, one, one quick question. Um, being from Hawaii, too, it, you know, we, we've always had this debate on the pre and post travel testing. And it, it seems for all intents and purposes, you know, there's there's really no post testing. A lot of it is done voluntarily. And uh, I'm glad to see, uh, well, I can say for my workers who work down at the airport when they come back from the mainland, they'll um, they'll stay out at least three days and get a post test and just make sure that, you know, they're negative before they come back to work because they work around a lot of people. What's your thought on, 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 on testing on both fronts, pre and post? Yes. Yeah, so, um, two different, they pick up two different things, right? They pick up exposures potentially, um, you know, in the five or six days before the, the, the test, um, and, and it's possible for a person to be exposed um, during travel, maybe not on the airplane. They tell us airplanes are pretty safe, um, but certainly in the in the period, you know, when you're in bathrooms or eating in the airport or or at other times. So, um, you know, the post testing, um, particularly for people who have uh, potential to transmit the virus to others, like if you were working in a nursing home, uh, if you were a nurse in a hospital. Um, those kinds of things are could be important. It's not necessarily required in, in most places around the world. Um, I'm going to Europe next week, and we are not required to be tested beforehand, although we will be. Um, and then we'll have the vaccination passes that work in all the countries in, in the European Union. And when we come back, we have to be tested 72 hours before getting on the airplane or tested on arrival. And then um, most other people are tested at day three to six. Again, um, you're not necessarily in quarantine if you have passed the first um, the test at the airport. So. OK, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, real happy to say that um, my wife works at the court and the judiciary just came out with a travel policy yesterday. So anyone that travels to the mainland and gets back to Hawaii required to take a test immediately upon landing and they got to take a second test 
uh, and they cannot go back to work unless that until they get the results of that test as being negative. And then they got to test again between three and five days after arrival, which I thought was spectacular. The judiciary is doing it right. They're preventing uh, their employees from coming back and spreading virus and, and, and really to keep their employees safe. So I wish our state would, in general, would take up that policy. And I think we'd keep out Omicron and any other potential vi variants that may come up uh, from our people coming back from the mainland, both residents and visitors as well. So anyway, Doc, Charles, um, I, our time is up, Charlie. Any, uh, I, Doc, any closing thoughts for our viewers? Uh, any words of advice? Any Anything that you want to make uh, put out to our viewers here? No, so I was giving a, a talk yesterday to the Korean American Medical Association, and I happened to be right after Tony Fauci. And um, I always remember the things he said, you know, we've worked together in HIV vaccines before. And, um, you know, if you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, get your booster when you need to, and then protect yourself at all times. Uh, and I think those are good words to, uh, to start the new year. And hopefully 2022 will be better uh, as more people are vaccinated. And as we, um, you know, come to grips with what we have to do in order to protect people and, um, and get on with our lives. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Charles. Well, it's it's always a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Jerome Kim um, on with us. And he's also an Iolani graduate. So uh, don't hold local, that again. <laughs> <laughs> local, local boy does good. But thank you for all of your contribution and for your service to our country there, Doc. And to uh, all of you that joined us tonight, thank you for weighing in. I know that uh, we didn't get to everyone's uh, question, but for the most part, thank you for sticking around and um, allowing the information to flow. And because, like I said before, if this is not your cup of tea and it didn't appeal to you, well, wait for the next time. Maybe we'll have a guest that will bring something that will appeal to you. But I think from based on the comments I've seen tonight, uh, Dr. Kim has made a definite impact on many of the viewers. So I thank him very much. Mel? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And again, I know some of you are jumping on now, expecting the show that usually starts at 7 and wondering, what the heck? You guys are done. Just go back and watch the replay. I will repost the YouTube link, guys. Go to my YouTube channel, Mel Raposo. Subscribe and click the icon, the bell icon, so you can get notified every time we go live or every time we post up a new video. Uh, following the show tonight will be a, get your apps. Uh, look in the comments. You'll see the link to our Clubhouse post show talk. Dr. Kim, you're welcome to jump on as well, man. Just go download clubhouse and it's just an audio thing and we'll we'll talk about the highlights we've got some doctors on there as well um but to dr kim i cannot thank you enough it's uh we're, we're honored and proud to know you uh we've never met personally but like i told our viewers before you came on you have never refused the invitation to come on our show you you've inspired me you've inspired a lot of people and most importantly you've, you've informed and educated a ton of people tonight and we appreciate you please stay safe doc uh, share our Thank aloha you. and love to our South Korean brothers and sisters. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to chatting with you again real soon, my friend. Thanks. Happy holidays. Thanks. Aloha, everybody. Take care.